steam locomotives in miniature at the steam workshop. This is part four, working on a five inch gauge steam locomotive and making some minor repairs. But on screen at the moment, this has nothing to do with the engine I'm rebuilding. It's some work that John Holroyd's been doing. This is a firebox wrapper, which is the outer skin of the boiler. And this is for a five inch gauge Great Western Railway Grange type engine. These are the mud hole door covers on the full size. And here we see John adjusting the mud hole cover so that they accurately fit on the curved section of the firebox wrapper. If I pan the camera out, you can see how much work and effort's gone into making this simple firebox wrapper. This blows me away. What is it? It's a scale model handle and mechanism to raise and lower the water scoop in a seven and a quarter inch gauge tender. And what's clever about this? Well, look at the angle. No, this is not a mistake. It's at 80 degrees, not 90 degrees. So the gears had to be specially cut. Not something I'd care to do. These are also made by John. Are these a component from the puzzle box from the film Hellraiser? No, they're called Clupet rings, or Clupe, or Clupet, I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'll put the spelling on screen. These are not made on a CNC machine. John makes these individually. In the past I've made piston rings, but not like these. So I think we'll call John Lord of the Rings. Anyway, that's enough of that back to reality. Meanwhile, in the parts washing area, is the engine that I'm currently working on, and it's steaming. Well, that's a start anyway. It's time now to continue with the job by cleaning up these horn stays. These are the parts of the engine that stop the axle boxes falling out and also support the springs. At the steam workshop, they don't have a flat bed belt sander like I have in my workshop, smug, smug, smug. Instead, they have this with the much longer belt, which doesn't wear quite as quickly. And it's a good gadget, but it's not very good if you want to get a perfect flat edge on the work. So as necessity is the mother of invention, I'm holding a piece of quarter inch steel plate behind the belt, which acts as a flat surface so I can press the parts against the belt and get a perfectly flat finish. It may seem like a lot of trouble to go to for some parts that are just never seen, they're behind the wheels and you don't often see them. But that's not the point, they still have to be right, they have to be cleaned up, they have to be primered, painted, before they're refitted to the engine. And there are four of these, because this is an 040 type of steam locomotive. There's a little bit of damage on one of them, but it's nothing to worry about. And don't forget, I'm not making a new engine, I'm restoring an old one. And this adds some charm and character to the job. In this clip, I'm cleaning up the brake rods, and again, these fit underneath, and they're fairly scabby, but by the time they've been rubbed down and primered, they'll be fine. This is a part of the foot plate getting the cleaning up treatment. When I was dismantling the engine, I was being very careful, but the bolt was so tightly fitted into the brake hanger socket, when I started to undo the bolt, the entire socket came out of the chassis. And here I am refitting it with some Loctite 603. Then all I have to do is just leave it for a while till the 603 cures, and then I can easily remove the bolt, leaving the socket in place. I was very careful on this engine not to shear off any bolts. I really do hate sheared off bolts, whether it be on a model or a full sized item. There were two sheared off bolts on this engine. This is the first one, and this is on the motion bracket where it secures the outer side bearing to hold the expansion link. There was a tiny little bit sticking out, so I tried the pliers, but no, it was in really tight, that's why it sheared. So I'm going to file it flat and drill it out. And I'm going to do this in a very unscientific way. So beginners, please take note. I would recommend that experts leave the room and maybe go and put the kettle on. Really, I should set this up in the drilling machine, but it's going to take too long. Because there was a very small piece of the bolt still sticking out of the motion bracket, it was easy to refit the outer bearing and then use the outer bearing as a drilling jig to drill out the bolt. I'm using a 2.3 millimeter drill. That's what John said is the tapping size for 6BA. Personally, I think that 6BA bolts are a bit weedy for this job. So I'm going to re-thread these holes 5BA, and I think that's a better size. In this clip, I'm drilling the holes much deeper to allow for a little bit of tolerance on the length of the bolts that can be fitted into these holes. And once the holes are drilled, it's time to thread them. This clip's speeded up. I don't normally tap at this speed. And at this speed, it may just prevent some viewers from slipping into a coma. And while you're watching me do this, I'm going to speak about something which is totally unrelated 
to threading holes in a motion bracket. I got lots of comments telling me off for using emery cloth in the lathe. My answer to that is, what a load of rubbish. A long, long time ago, when dinosaurs ruled the earth, there was said to be a problem, allegedly, with sanding parts in the lathe. Now, I've done this for years and my lathe's still fine, but some viewers are getting really intense and very anal about this. Let me explain. Sand is abrasive. Sand on the bed is not a good thing. Sand in your underpants is not a good thing. And sand in the headstock bearings is even worse. Modern headstock bearings are quite well shrouded and sealed against ingression of sand or any other foreign bodies into the bearing area. I machine quite a lot of castings, gunmetal castings and cast iron castings, which are all cast using sand, and quite a lot of this sand remains stuck to the casting when you get it, whether it be just under the skin of the casting or in any orifices within the casting. In the episode covering how to machine a model steam engine cylinder, in my series How to Build a Model Steam Engine, I clearly show how much sand came out of a sand casting. So if you're worried about grit and sand getting into the parts of the lathe, it's a bit late for that really. And this is all I'm going to say on this subject. And while I've been dealing with all the comments about sanding in the lathe, I've been test fitting the outer bearing to the motion bracket using some 5BA bolts that are cut to size, and now it's time to put the outer bearing into some cellulose thinners to dissolve the paint. By the way, I nearly forgot, the engine that's on the bench next to me was given a test steaming at the weekend, and if you'd like to see this engine in steam, you can visit the Steam Workshop Facebook page, where I think Simon put a video up there of him actually driving it. Apparently it needs some more lead ballast at the back because the main water tank is already full of lead and it's a bit front heavy. The next job I'm doing is removing the handrails from the top of the tanks. And this is a bit of a pain, I really don't know how these have been put in because geometrically it doesn't work. The inboard handrail stanchion at the front must have been put in last and maybe just soldered into the hole. The way that the top part of the tank is fixed to the main part of the tank is a little bit strange. These are not just nuts coming off studs, the whole stud is coming out. And that's because the small brass nuts must be locked tighted to the brass studding. I often do this around cylinder covers on steam engines, but not normally at the top of a tank. I think I would just use proper studs with little nuts that come off, because the problem is, doing it this way, it's impossible to get the stud all the way out because the nut hits the underside of the handrail and then it won't come out any further. I've got to start somewhere, so the best thing to do is to slacken off all the nuts and see what happens. And it's as I said, as I'm undoing the brass nut, the brass stud is coming with it, but they can't come fully out because the handrail is in the way. Initially, I left the spectacle plate and the cab roof attached to one of the tanks. But this now needs to be detached so I can remove the top of the tank. The good thing was, as I slackened off the nut and stud combinations, it helped to break the seal between the tank top and the tank, and eventually the top of the tank came loose. Early on in this job, I did notice that underneath one of the tanks there was a sheared bolt, so it's now time to fix this. First of all, I'm going to drill out the old bolt, and no, I'm not in the drilling machine, I can do this by hand, I've done enough of this to be able to do things like this very accurately. But if you're a beginner and you're doing something like this, I recommend that you file the bolt top flat, use a centre punch in a magnifying glass, centre punch the centre of the bolt, then drill it out in the drilling machine. What I have now is a one eighth of an inch diameter hole in the bottom of the tank, and the good news is it goes right through the top of the original bolt which is soldered into the tank, so by drilling through the tank and the bolt itself, I can get a good depth of thread all the way through. I'm using a 4BA tap in this clip to thread the hole in the bottom of the tank. When doing a job like this, it's good to sit and think how you're going to do it beforehand. Well, I've already done that. So I've drilled the hole, I've threaded the hole, and now I'm screwing a bolt into the hole. How do I fix this bolt in position? Because it is a water tank and it's going to leak. I could solder it, but no. I would never attempt to solder an old water tank, because you may fix the problem you've currently got, and cause about 10 more leaks. Instead, I fitted the bolt from the inside using some Loctite 603, and that's going nowhere. Then all I do is chop off the bolt with a pair of pliers, 
and clean up the end very lightly on the belt sander, then fit the nut. Really, I should have fitted the nut first, I know, and chopped it off, so please don't write in and tell me about that. I generally do things the hard way sometimes, and it always works out. A belt sander is a very gentle device if you use it carefully, so the end of the bolt doesn't get distorted and the nut goes on very easily. So how far have I got? Well, I've removed the lid from one of the tanks, ready to remove the handrail, and now it's the turn of the other tank. In this clip you can see that the front of the handrail stanchion is not actually attached to the tank, so it's an easy job to move it back and forth and just slide it out of the rest of the handrail stanchions. Also, I thought. The handrail just did not want to pull through the handrail stanchions. I didn't want to break anything, so a quick light touch of some WD-40 should do the trick. That's more like it. Once the WD-40 started to penetrate, the handrail came out of the stanchions very easily. And once all the small securing bolts were removed, all I had to do was stick my finger in the filler hole and pull hard. And it was quite easy to remove the top of the tank. In this clip you can clearly see the remains of the sealant, the main water feed from the tank at the bottom, and the axle pump bypass valve and pipe at the top. So the engine's come quite a long way from when it looked like this. The good thing about this little engine is it's very well made, and despite years of neglect, with a bit of effort it can be brought back to being a very good small steam locomotive. Quite a lot of the parts are now ready for a repaint, and I'm hoping that Dave at Steam Workshop will have started that by the time I get back there next Tuesday. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.